Welcome to Citizen Assembly Indigenize, a Citizen Assembly meeting produced by the Universal Community Project and the Neighborhood Responsiveness Marketplace. Let's not ask how we can support Indigenous and Native Americans with money and flyers, although you can still do that too. Rather, let us ask how we can emulate them and live in holistic balance with each other and our Earth. Join kindred spirits in examining, examining Indigenous and Native American community systems and traditions. The program will begin with a presentation of Indigenous thoughts and actions, then participants will discuss ways of implementing the same in our own daily lives. Participants can return and share experiences, what worked and what didn't. If you want to get involved, our current contact information is in the video description. Let's start with a round of introductions to tell our listeners who we are and where we're from. I'll start. I'm Stacy Gustafson. I split my time between Northern Michigan and Southwest Texas, and my major focus is holistic community problem solving. And next we have Kat. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Uh, my name is Kathleen Newman. I live in Stockport, uh, United Kingdom, and I'm not sure what else to say. <laughs> Thank you very much. So happy to have you here, Kat. And I look forward to hearing what we had discussed in the beginning before we started recording. That is going to be great. Kevin, go ahead. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi there. My name is Kevin. I'm calling in from just north of Toronto in Treaty 3 territory and the Credit River watershed um, traditional territory of the um, Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, my interest is in the trajectory of knowledge and Indigenous concepts within non-Indigenous allies. Thanks for having this space for us today, Stacey. Thank you so much, Kevin. So glad to have you here. Uh, Daniel, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Daniel Tweed. I'm in the Cayagas Creek watershed, traditional land of the Chumash tribal people here in Ventura County, California, where I am also intending to make another go at city council. <laughs> and um, I'll be setting up at the Rotary Club Street Fair booth here in town, if anyone wants to check that uh, fair out. It's on October 17th, 2021, which is also uh, the day that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was signed in 1948 in Paris, at the base of the Eiffel Tower there. So um, I'm hoping to have the planet indigenized by 2048 on the 100th anniversary. So <laughs> I said, did a, a goal. And uh, with me is uh, Larry that I do some home care uh, companionship with. Uh, he's indigenous, uh, Choctaw uh, mostly. And he'll be uh, kind of, you want to say anything, Larry? Uh... Don't speak Indian. <laughs> You don't have to speak. Uh, Swash day, that's about all I know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so glad you're here, Larry, thanks. Good to see you. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you for being here as well. Uh, and Cynthia, last but not least. Uh, I am very grateful to be here. My name is Cynthia Leonard. I am in the heart of Potawatomi, Blackfoot, Choctaw, and Cherokee country in Arkansas. And and yeah, it's I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for being here as well. So today, uh, our presentation is about an indigenous food forest project. Uh, this one is featuring Dr. Andrew Judge, who is an Indigenous leader from the Ontario region. And Cynthia is going to start screen sharing now. We're going to show you his, the first half of his initiative and then open it up for some discussion. In the go, the spirit calls me Mokomase, bear walker. Um, um, Anishinaabe, Anini, um, Indau, I'm an Anishinaabe man. I was raised, I was born and raised along the Horn of the Serpent River, present day uh, London, Ontario. Um, and thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I hope that some of you have the um, uh, 
uh, audacity uh, to take action after today uh, because we need everybody that we can to move their body in a new way on this earth uh, because the way that we've been moving is all of us uh, is uh, quite damaging destructive and uh, but i don't want to make this too bleak um uh, of course, some of you might know me, some of you might not. Uh, um, I am very tired, so tirelessly is a bit of an overstatement. <laughs> I was up real early. We've been running in the sugar bush out here in the uh, Bauting. I live in present-day Sault Ste. Marie. This was a, a gathering place for Indigenous peoples uh, from across the land for generations. So I have some uh, slides that I'm going to share with you in a presentation on climate change and taking action. Uh, please listen as best as you can. Um, try to be present. If you're overwhelmed at any moment, uh, try and take a breath, um, a deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth and uh, go to the place of the heart rather than the place of the mind that um, can uh, cause some challenges. So um, this is a meditation on remembering it, what it means to be human. And that is what the Anishinaabe people, that is what I teach as an Anishinaabe Nini, as an Anishinaabe man. Um, we are a people who lived from the heart. Um, and I'll go into that, the details of that, because that's what this is really about. Uh, and it's, it's, it's so much more than that. But two of my teachers, one from uh, Central America in the highlands of Guatemala, Tata Ushla Hutnoch. Of course, I was initiated by him about eight years ago, and I did ceremony this morning in honor of that initiation. Um, today is uh, nine uh, emosh, nine being a number uh, relevant to the divine power of the woman and emosh is the collective consciousness the place that we all originate that collective swamp where we all came from but uh him and onabanese uh, jim dumont uh, incredible anishinaabe elder have both said the same thing by connecting the mind to the heart you can unlock the secrets of the universe so I just really encourage you for the next, whatever I have, 30 minutes or so, to rather than try to interpret what I'm saying, try to absorb what I'm saying um, into the space of the heart. Because if, you're cons if your mind's going to go, you're going to forget everything. And then um, these are seeds. These are seeds. This knowledge is powerful. It has guided my life. Has transformed me as a person and continues to transform me as a person. Uh, and we always, uh, we all, I was given that warning, you know, that this knowledge is powerful. We can use it to do good and we can also use it to cause harm. So, where do you live? <clears throat> Hopefully, a lot of you are in that uh, southwestern Ontario region there. I'm just uh, moving the camera so I don't get distracted. Um, there's a story that's just almost never been told to the people of southwestern Ontario, and that is that you live in a land that was originally uh, an engineered landscape, the entire thing. In fact, from about Guelph through to Kitchener, down to London, into Niagara Falls, Windsor, all the way down to the Carolinas, there was uh, a, an essential paradise when um, colonizers arrived. In fact, when they arrived, they didn't see anybody. And they thought it was a terra nullius. And in fact, it was a, a completely habited, habited land designed by indigenous people over a hundred generations or more um, to produce an abundance unlike you or I have ever or will ever see in our lifetimes. And that is because um, the first wave, the first pandemics that swept across our nations, 
uh, killed approximately 90% of our populations between um, 1500 and 1600 when the first treaty with our fish was broken. And the um, true intention of the colonizers that arrived became apparent. But when they still arrived, even 100 years later, there were still massive civilizations, tens of thousands of people living throughout southwestern Ontario and far, far beyond, uh, trading amongst each other. And I want you to just picture this for a second, because it, it, I need you to get out of your head this idea of the primitive Indian, this idea that we were these, you know, brown people with long hair roaming around in the forest with diapers on looking for the next thing to kill. Nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. Our civilizations had adapted to the places in which they thrived over generations through uh, um, engineering our environment, not for the benefit of the human. In fact, the human benefit came last. Our relationship to our brothers and our sisters, the plants and the animals, the trees, the sky, the earth, and the bones of our ancestors has a story which almost no one has been told in, in North America. And how do I know this? Because I work on the land. I've seen the ancient oaks that are still in southwestern Ontario, the few remaining ancient oaks, you know, three, four hundred years, there's only a few left. All the rest have been cut down. All the sweet chestnuts have been cut down. The 200 foot tall sweet chestnuts that produced, you know, 5,000 pounds of food every season or in the seasons that they did. Um, there are 65 species of uh, trees in the Carolinian zone, uh, over 1,200 species of medicines, um, you know, so many plants, so many birds, so many animals, uh, so many fish in just uh, the, the lake or the river that I grew up on. There are 94 species of fish. What I want you to realize is that the people who were destroyed there, who were, in, who were attempted to be annihilated, we knew them all. We knew every single one. Um, we had mastered our environment and our consciousness was so attuned that just the glimpses that I've experienced is, um, to give you an example, I think it was yesterday morning, I dreamt that I was, uh, I was either a whale or a dolphin, but I was the whale or the dolphin, I'm not sure. And I was, um, and this is connected to the talk on Sunday with um, Autumn and Stephanie Peltier, Autumn Peltier being an icon and a water protector recognized around the world. Uh, she spoke to our community here and uh, she, we talked about the importance of the water and protecting it and recognizing that we've poisoned almost every single river that we've touched. Um, but I was, I was this whale and I was uh, diving down deep into the water and swimming up fast, breaching the water and psh, blowing out my blowhole. It was, you know, an, an over and over psh, and, so that is the kind of experiences that I have um, regularly. Um, and I believe it is because I've awakened to the truth of what it means to be a human. And uh, I, th I believe that in order to go past, to go even further so that all of us can experience the beauty of creation, um, we have to do more. And so what were some of the plants grown in this space? Well, just take a look at the list. The bones of the ancestors found in southwestern Ontario are some of the healthiest bones to ever be found in the entire world. We had engineered a landscape that included these multiple layers, not that magically grew. We designed them. We designed them with the idea that all of our relatives should thrive, 
not just us. And we knew that if we allowed our relatives to thrive, like the cattails and the puffballs and the hazelnuts and the acorns and the elderberry and the strawberry and the wild rice and the wild carrot and the wild plum. And we say this word wild today because we, uh, the colonized mind positions these things as outside of the human consciousness. When in fact, we adapted with these things over time, with these, with these relatives, these relations. And when we eat these um, um, relatives, when we consume them, because in our story, they gave and give up their lives for our thriving. That's what they do. That's how they um, love us. And all that they ask is that we don't take too much from them. Their civilizations, like the potato and the beans and the hickory nut and the brambleberry and the choke cherry, have just as much of a right to thrive as us. And let's face it, we're not thriving anymore. So take this list down, look at it. And when you look at this list, um, you know, it can be a little bit overwhelming. This is just, this is just you know, a very abbreviated list of what's uh, provided you in the region where you live and where I live for a lot of time. Um, but what I want you to recognize is that the indigenous people who are living here, uh, for example, the Chinatan, and I'll just go back living in Kitchener, of course, uh, oh, I can't even remember, Strasbourg Creek, I think, is that the right creek? Or I'm pretty sure it's Strasbourg or somewhere in Kitchener anyways, they just found a village and they, you know, they didn't uncover it. They didn't want to tell the truth. But essentially, um, the picture that I want you to have of our civilizations was one where within our communities of these longhouses, you know, 200 longhouses that, and, and, and it would take me like, you know, an hour just to explain the construction of the longhouse and how, where the longhouses were built, the community had designed the landscape such that they could harvest in a hundred years from now, the, um, the bows of the ribs of the, the longhouse. They were designing the floor of the longhouse by planting the spruce trees in their region. This was not a, a bunch of, you know, wild people living in the forest marauding around. This was uh, some of the most sophisticated, um, connected people uh, to ever live. And, and I don't think we will see that again in my lifetime, but I will do everything that I can to remind people what we are capable of as human beings. And so I was asked today to talk about, you know, an indigenous framework of sustainability, sustainability. and that's really hard to do because of what the um, colonized mind has portrayed us as, right? And I want you to know that if you thought that or you think that and you continue to think that you've been lied to <laughs> and it's sad. It's not just that um, in, indigenous people were stolen from, everybody was stolen from because of what they stole from us. We could be living in a habitat right now with, with an abundance for all. And I believe that we can recreate it. Um, but it's going to take time. It's going to take dedication and energy. But these strategies, they support in the recovery of indigenous land-based knowledge or traditional ecological knowledge, which has been practiced sustainably throughout Turtle Island by indigenous people for generations. Um, when we practice this knowledge, something happens to your body. How do I know? Because I practice it. Um, something happens to your mind. And I think most importantly, something happens to your heart. Okay? You begin to remember. Okay? 
So our philosophies as Indigenous people are grounded in understanding that humans in the environment are bound in a relationship of reciprocity, respect, and obligation, not coercion and domination. And if you're wondering why we're in a situation like that now, look to your own actions. You, one has to start at ground zero. And there's a lot of healing to be done. Right, so there's a word that we have, Ajwe Manishna, Ajwe Manishna, and and I feel like it's important to sing this song um, to you all who are here uh, present. And I wish I could see your faces, all of you. I, I can only see like six of you right now in the corner, um, but I wish I could see all of your faces uh, when I sing this song. But um, this song has to do with this really important concept that we have as Anishinaabe people. And try and say it if you can, but it's And when we pray, when we give thanks, we're not just you know, praying to something out there. We're praying about the things that we have to do, the actions that we have to do. But Ajwe Manishna, Ajwe Manishna is, is basically a conversation with God. And what we're saying to God is, I'm just a human. I'm just a human. Uh, have compassion for me. Some people will say, have pity on me, take pity on me. But I like to say, have compassion for me. And it's not just that we have to have compassion for ourselves. We also have to have compassion for each other that we're human, that I make mistakes. I make mistakes on the land and my land work. I make mistakes with my family. I make mistakes with my friends, with my students. Um, and so it's so easy to point out the mistakes that people make and point at them and say, you've made a mistake instead of saying, how can we learn together and grow together from this mistake? How, how can we recognize that I've made a mistake too in my life, sometimes big, sometimes small. Um, and so that's really what this, this word is about. Uh, so I'm going to just, I'm going to sing this song and I'm going a little bit off um, the script that I had planned, uh, but that's okay. I'm really tired. <laughs> I've been going since like super early this morning and um, um, I'll be going super early tomorrow morning as well. So um, uh, yeah, let me just see what the next slide is. Okay. So take a deep breath into the nose and out through the mouth. Relax your shoulders. If you find in this moment that your tongue is stuck to the roof of your mouth, let it release. That is the, that is the homeostasis of the colonized mind is this tense and stressed and, you know, there's something to do and we have to go get it. And, you know, I just let go for a second if it's only for this moment um, and just try to try to absorb this song, um, have compassion on for me, and I'm gonna thanks to the uh, I'm gonna give thanks to the moon, uh, because she is uh, just ending showing her full face to us, and she'll be rising um, just um, about an hour after we finish tonight. And I'm gonna give thanks to the sun, Mishomiskizis, because those are two of the um, ancestors, the relatives that we have that we are dependent on for our survival. Me. <laughs> 
miguehech, thank you. Miguehech, no comesquises, miguehech, thank you, Grandmother Moon. Miguehech, no comesquises, miguehech, que So that song is a song that can be sung for hours, and sometimes I do when I'm working on the land. I, I, I sing that song and I give thanks. I give thanks for my place here as a human, that these teachings that were uh, shared by our ancestors, that I believe them. I believe them to be true. I believe that our ancestors knew something. They had secrets about the universe and we're awakening them again. We're reawakening them by restoring the consciousness that surrounds us, by not destroying it anymore. If we, if we are naive to think that you know, the deer and the wolves and the bears and the eagles and the hawks are not part of our consciousness, then what are we really as humans? And so we teach that the most ancient of our relatives are the minerals. And they made an agreement with the plants. And see, the minerals had to forget everything that they thought they knew. You see, this is connected to our creation story. And at the beginning of our creation story, there's a sound that emerges in the nothingness that was the nothingness which was essentially everything. And in, in that moment, there was something in the nothingness that emerged, something in the every possibility that exists in every nothingness. And that was a sound, shishigwe. And I can't sing the song that this is connected to because this is being recorded, but it's so beautiful because it says shishigwe minon do wa na. To that first sound, I hear you, I remember. And that's why I say, go back to your heart. Because that is the first sound in creation. You are a reflection of the great spirit coming to know itself as the most beautiful being in the whole universe. And it chose this place, Ishkakamakwe, our mother, the earth, to allow its consciousness to evolve. To this point, <laughs> this moment in time that is unlike any other in the history of all the beings who have come and gone before us. And so these consciousnesses emerged over time, billions. Okay, thank you so much, Cynthia, for sharing that with us. And I before I open it, the floor to the group, I just want to say, listening to this man and other Native American leaders and elders, it, it relieves this anxiety that I carry with me all the time when I listen to their wisdom. It, it's not just this Dr. Andrew Judge. And um, 
I so appreciate that. It, it's something that isn't in my culture, I feel like. And then he says these amazing things like, you were born as part of the universe. And, and we don't hear that. I don't hear that from my culture. And it really touches me. It really means something to me. And, and I don't think it's just uh, hooey, the way that we've thought of these things um, as we we're growing up and, and told as Americans. I, I think this is beautiful and, and has a real place and, and I want it so badly. So that's what I would like to say about that. Uh, we've got another about 20 minutes for next week where he actually goes more into the food project and building the food forest. Um, but for right now, I, I would love to discuss what we've just heard in this video. Does anybody have any comments that they would like to share? Cool, go ahead. Yeah, I thought that was actually live for a second. I, I thought we were going to be, be a little to ask him questions. But uh, what is the name of the, uh, the food project that's currently underway? So the... This video was part of the Faith Food Forest launch or Faith Food Forest project. And it is where um, Nicola, who has urban food forest plans, gets together with churches and synagogues and creates their, their, their um, food plots, these food forests. She has this amazing no-till method. Um, so he is, he's explaining his part, the indigenous side, and she is explaining her part, the urban side. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'll look it up. I'm interested in the no-till method. I'm interested in all of it. I mean, the idea of the commons is something that's been me forever and just having free food um, instead of just decorative plants and non-edible plants everywhere, uh, I think would be a tremendous help. Um, you know, I, 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 of course, want to research everything about it. And if it does have any ill effects to the economy, um, somehow counteract that, or again, be an agent for um, you know, the massive shift. Not a revolutionary. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Kat, you're up next. Yeah, I think it's so beautiful how his tribe had, you know, for generations, made the forest to like produce so much food. It was just amazing. I mean, what he, what he talked about and how like the rivers were healthy and just seemed so ideal you know what they did and how they did it uh yeah so thank I, you are, are you done so i wonder how can we do something like that today i know uh when i left the states i know in arizona they were starting things like that slowly so maybe it's it's been uh, continued in the states where like in urban areas they grow fruit trees and things like that is it i mean from what i've heard it it's still going on in the states right i'm sorry what was the question one more time uh that some cities are actually putting aside places where you can grow trees with fruit. I have seen local garden areas and it seems like it's becoming more common, but I'm not so sure that, um, I, I personally haven't heard about it being a, um, this food forest, bring it back to the original way the land was worked by the indigenous and wouldn't that be wonderful if all of those areas could be switched to that as well yeah yeah uh daniel go ahead yeah i think uh there is a thriving uh study of this it's called permaculture which is kind of a uh mashup or portmanteau of uh, uh permanent agriculture permaculture permanent agriculture it's also called regenerative agroforestry, uh, silva pasturing. Uh, there's lots of lots of different uh, iterations of it. It, it, it kind of goes back to Australia, a uh, guy named Bill Mollison uh, kind of kind of popularized it, but it, it, there's also a guy before him in Japan who wrote a book called One Straw Revolution. So it is an international movement. Um, if you want to become a permaculture designer, uh, there are classes that generally take about 40 hours of uh, about half hands-on work and half, uh, you know, uh, classroom type instruction. And 
and once once you become a certified permaculture designer, you can you can certify and teach others. Uh, it it works with um, looking at zones um, where you go very often and, and where you go less often, and also it has layers from the root crops up seven different kinds of plantings to the canopy crops, and and then. You usually involves making swales and, and small ravines where the rainwater can naturally uh, flow across the landscape. Um, and it's there's a whole 12 ethics of permaculture. I, I often thought it would be cool to make a little clock for each of the ethics, like the 12 um, positions of the clock. Um, but yeah, I would I would really encourage people to just Google permaculture. They'll find tons of great resources. And I, I think they are working, permaculturalists do want to work with the indigenous people who had these, these food forests, just intuitively created them. And those, those should be the plants that are not considered uh, invasive, you know, but, are, but are native. And then I, I just want to also say, I have one of these uh, exercise things and it makes a great drum. I was kind of drumming along with Andrew <laughs> during his uh, song. So, uh, that's all I have to say right now. Thanks. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, I want to admit uh, very ashamedly that although I have heard you talking for since last October about permaculture, I did not understand that it was permanent agriculture or that it had anything to do with what we're talking about with the indigenous <laughs> food forests. So I apologize for not listening more closely. It clearly is exactly what we've been talking about. Thank you very much. You're forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> Cynthia. Remember when I was saying that you you say it to them and they might not be ready to hear it, but eventually it'll sink yes. in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's Cynthia, exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Cynthia, please tell us again. That was at the end of the of the Citizen Assembly women that you just had that spoke of missing and murdered Indigenous women. And if you could just repeat what you had said. Uh, that we should speak truth to to everyone and if they're not prepared to hear it speak it to them anyway just because they're not ready to hear it then does not mean that they will not hear it eventually and it is important that they hear it um, and and I use the analogy of, of when you love someone who's not willing to receive it it burns like hot coals upon their head like that truth is going to sink in you just need to put it there that's all you got to do and then, you know, don't engage, don't argue, just, just put it there and walk away. And that is what Daniel did. He put it there and it <laughs> burned for about 10 months <laughs> and finally sunk in. <laughs> Thank I'm you. I'm obviously not a great permaculture instructor, <laughs> but I, I'm looking, <laughs> I'm looking to get certified if, you know, if I can find a good deal on a, on a class uh, sometime. <laughs> there it's out there in the universe. So, um, Kevin, do you have any comments for us about this video? Well, um, I've been kind of busy doing a whole bunch of other things at the same time. Um, however, um, Andrew is seemingly not too far from where I live. He's in Waterloo, and which is about less than two hours away from where I am. So that's exciting. Um, and really that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's great to see that you've been able to find that video, uh, Stacy, and include it in our chat today, because this is, uh, very relevant to, very, very relevant to, uh, to my, you know, my belief and my understanding and, and what I try to, um, help perpetuate and share that information as much as I can. Um, with people around the world. So yeah, that's a great job in finding that, so. And Kevin, actually you are the person, uh, as you so often are, that um, brings these things to us. So Kevin, you introduced me to the Shinguak Kinemage Gameg, uh, Algoma University teaching videos. And 
I, the first time that I was invited was by you. And I happened to tune into the water video that he was talking about with Stephanie and uh, she, we, they had an enormous crowd. Every, people just love her. And uh, she educates us about the waters. And so thank you very much for tuning me into Andrew Judge. And that is how I found this video. So it's from you, Kevin. Thank you. So um, I would like to ask then how do we make this happen in our lives? I mean, no, we haven't seen the actual plan for how Andrew wants us to plant, but we did see a list of the plants. We're talking chestnut, hawthornberry, uh, they're unusual plants, pawpaw, uh, puffball, and I'm thinking I, I want to create a simple system for your average person to just say, oh, I would love to buy some seeds or buy one tree or one little thing that I can do. And then if every average person out there is in on this fad and they plant something that is a heritage plant, how much further would that get our landscape towards the, um, towards re-indigenizing the landscape and and it's at least a start maybe it wouldn't work exactly the same but it's a start so i want to get that word out there and in in a simple way that people can do simple things so um is there anybody else who has an idea about how they could make this happen in their lives uh, kathleen you were talking to me about uh before the show about some natural planting that you have done and bees would you like to tell us about that uh, I'm just trying to make my garden insect friendly. I also feed birds, so uh, I think sometimes the birds eat the insects, so that's good. <laughs> but I, I am having a problem with snails now, but a lot of people have suggested, you know, use, uh, I forget what you call them, they're like s snail bait or something. And I'm like, I really don't want to use anything that's not natural at all, especially I don't want anything that could put bees in danger. And uh, So what uh, things have you done for your garden? What natural things? Just made it so it's, it's very hospitable to animals. I've let like uh, wildflowers grow, you know, because the bees don't need just one flower. They need many different types of flowers. And then also I, I uh, last year I had uh, two bumblebees make a nest uh, because there's a certain type of bumblebee that makes a nest in dirt. So they made a nest in one of my bigger plant pots. I haven't seen them this year, though, but they might have been somewhere else. Uh, please finish the story, Kathleen. You uh, built a, a box for them then? Uh, yeah, I built, like, just out of normal wood, I built, like, a... a a bee thing for them, you know, like a bee house, but it, it attracted, uh, it worked. Yeah. It, but it, it worked, but it attracted honeybee. I mean, honeybees. Yeah. A swarm of honeybees. So a honey, a swarm of honeybees are about to set up shopping. <laughs> and I was like, Oh no, I just want my two bumblebees. In there. Yeah. Because I live too close to my neighbor and they have kids. So I couldn't exactly have like a bee house in my backyard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I had to, unfortunately, I had to dismantle it. But uh, I, I just made it so the rain wouldn't go onto the whole of the, of the, of the bumblebees. So the, that's what happened in the end. Go ahead, Daniel. 
there are bees that are solitary, like the bumblebee. They don't make a hive like the ordinary honeybees do. And uh, there are actually little, cute little solitary bee uh, nooks you can kind of make. They're just like little rolled up pieces of cardboard and, and things so that, that don't take up much space. But it would almost be fun to include one in like a little free library. That <laughs> I was thinking of like little bee library. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, those, those plants that Andrew Judge mentioned are great for that uh, Carolina Great Lakes area, I'm, I'm sure. But, you know, there are different adapted plants for different uh, areas of, of the world. And a great resource is like the University of California, I know, has a master gardeners program. And they're constantly giving, you know, free workshops. And, and sometimes you can even take the classes uh, for free and, and I think they do like native plant walks and um, they have like a helpline you know yeah, just just look up the uh, cooperative extension there's usually a college wherever you are and there's a cooperative extension program that will answer all these kinds of questions about what's good to grow where you are <laughs> and uh, and then I, I think uh, you know that that what three words program that that identifies uniquely each little nine foot by nine foot square on the earth is going to be really cool for uh, doing this kind of work. And, you know, if we could each like adopt a few of those squares and, and sort of one, one thing I want to do is um, there's a thing called um, bury your underwear to test for soil health, where you get a brand new um, pair of 100% cotton underwear and you, you bury it uh, in the soil for like 30 days. And if your soil is full of like microbes and diversity and healthy, the underwear will basically be all eaten away. But if your soil is dead, you dig up the, the cotton underwear in 30 days and it'll just still look the same. So it would be great to get an inventory of all these areas of the earth, just like get a baseline uh, soil health in this inventory because you really don't grow food until you grow the soil. So that's a spiel about that. <laughs> That is so, so important, the, the health of the soil. This is something I'm also just learning about, that there should be pounds of stuff going on in the, sto in the soil, pounds of living things. And they're now, I'm starting to see articles in the news, the soil is dead and, and how can you support people on dead soil? And then uh, you brought up something, Daniel. Oh, go ahead, Kevin. I was just going to mention when it comes to soil and um, rebuilding soil in terms of um, biochar and terra preta. Uh, it's a two word, uh, T-E-R-R-A-P-R-E-T-A. Terra preta is an indigenous, um, uh, indigenous philosophy in soil management. It's, it's taking uh, is taking wood, turning it into biochar and mixing it with compostables to create terra preta, which is a supercharged soil amendment. Um, so just wanted to add that. Thanks. Well, that sounds wonderful, Kevin. Thank you very much for mentioning that. Um, and I can, I can add something to that, that the reason that's so amazing is because a little ping pong ball size of, of uh, biochar has the surface area of a tennis court and it's like a little porous life raft for these soil microbes to colonize and uh, do their magic with and one way we've really destroyed soil microbes is with roundup you know roundup is just terrible for the bacterial food web uh, diversity in the soil and um oh you everyone should do global warming too <laughs> global warming they should raise vermicultures like you can take all your food scraps and these red wiggler worms will just eat them uh, in a matter of a couple of weeks. And the, the stuff that they produce, the, the worm poop, is, is like almost as good as biochar. <laughs> but you do have to inoculate the biochar. You want to like uh, activate it biologically. And there's instructions about doing that online. So just more random <laughs> you know, permaculture knowledge is probably going to pop up as we go here. Thank you, Daniel. I, I'm so excited to hear all your knowledge uh, about that. And going back to something you said before. Um, it, okay. We see the ancient plants and trees that they, that they had going then. And, and permaculture, you're talking about, has some substitutes for that. 
could you speak more to, um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm a little concerned about how we could really bring back and live off of the old plants. We, we've, we've changed a lot. And so you say that California will give you a list of, or other states can give you a list of what they believe would work? Yeah, most universities are going to have an agriculture department and they're going to have a list of what's considered uh, a native plant and what's considered an invasive or an exotic plant, for instance. Uh, you know, there, there's um, some debate about like what's considered native and what's what's not, because what are you going to use as a cutoff? You know, I think we should really use that pre-contact uh, 1600 era, you know, <laughs> that uh, Andrew Judge is uh, talking about. but. We're in a drought, so there might have to be a lot of food resilience um, done, you know, in kind of controlled climates and, you know, in, you know, little microgreen uh, growing environments and things. Kevin has a comment, I think. I had a burning thought come to my mind and then it ran away and I'm so reflectant upon the fact that I'm an old man and I can't uh -huh. keep a hold of my thoughts. I feel the Happens to me all the time. Just uh, jump in next time. Just, just go ahead and blurt it out next time. <laughs> that happens to yeah. me too. <laughs> uh, so uh, speaking of how we can emulate this in our lives, is there anything that anybody- I got it, I got it, I got it. It go. was- it was the concept of invasive plants and to think about that's very very important to for a lot of people don't realize that um there is a tremendous amount of retailed um uh retailed greenhouse products that have been produced by way of specifically gmo um um, elements, if you will. Um, Home Depot, when you think of large retailers within live goods, you have to expect that the majority of retailers are selling products that have in one way or another been genetically modified. Sometimes, and I know this through a friend of mine, local friend of mine that's been 30 years within biodiversity, and she's taught me that um, within this modification of retail plants, um, uh, often there, they can be um, adapted to ha have different smells, be, be more fragrant, um, be, uh, be a brighter color um, at, at shelf level. And there are small modifications within plants that are uh, designed for us, but negatively impact uh, biodiversity within within your space. Um, so I think it's very important to try and identify um, try and identify the products that you're purchasing and if not look for specifically look for the small independent um, that is, is more connected to the because in large scale retail development there's been a wide, a uh, span of adaptations done to simple flower products, not including anything to do with food uh, yield. Thank you, Kevin. I, I want to jump right on board that and say, we need to decimate our normal marketplace here. It, there are so few products that are actually beneficial to the world that are in the regular marketplace. We need to my honest opinion, we need to not put our money there. And I think our government is broken and we can't make changes through it at any meaningful pace. And the only thing that we have left is voting with our dollars and we have to not put it into the regular marketplace. And uh, I hope that I can soon practice what I preach. If there are a no- quick, uh, quick comment about what Kevin was saying. Uh, I did see a monarch butterfly uh, out the window today and their, their population has gone down like 90% because all the Roundup has killed all the milkweed that they need to eat and lay their eggs on. But even milkweed, it, there's a specific kind of milkweed that's butterfly friendly. So don't just, don't just plant milkweed, make sure you ask your nursery uh, for the butterfly friendly milkweed <laughs> if you're going to do that. Uh, it was just a quick comment I wanted to jump in with. 
That's super information. So if there aren't any more comments, we can move into closing remarks. Uh, Daniel, do you want to just jump right in there with the closing remark? Learn permaculture. <laughs> That's great. Uh, go indigenize. Uh, yeah, patronize your farmers markets, uh, check out Seed Savers Exchange, uh, and especially, uh, you know, it looks like uh, there's food scarcity, there's inflation picking back up. So th this is a time when your neighbors are gonna be especially interested in hearing about uh, community resilience and food security and all the cool native ways that can be rediscovered <laughs> if you keep uh, tuning in to programs like Indigenize. So thank you, I pass along. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I do also believe that people are really ready for this. So it, it's, it, I think it will be less difficult to bring the subject up and tell other people about it. Thank you, Daniel. Cole, would you like to give us some closing remarks? Maybe he stepped away. Kathleen. Oh, you, you know what, Larry, you, does Larry have anything to say? I forgot oh, to ask you. Yeah, Larry. He's probably uh, got some elder wisdom on this. Happy Father's Day, Father Larry. <laughs> oh yeah, Happy Father's Day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Made a lot of mistakes as dad. <laughs> um, well, I tell you, every time I listen to you guys, it's uh, amazing the uh, depth that uh, you can go into. Uh, I never even thought about so many of these things that. Uh, are really very important. It starts at the from the dirt. If the soil is not healthy, good luck with everything else. Mm. I, if I just come away with that knowledge, I think I'm <laughs> all I knew about dirt was what when I was playing baseball was digging into it with my spikes. <laughs> it occurred to me that uh, it's everything. <laughs> Uh, that's all I've got to say. So true. So true, Larry. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, let's see, who should we go to next? Kevin, would you like to give us some closing remarks? Yeah, you know, a closing remark that I would like to share is that what we're doing here today is extremely important because we are investing the time to try and learn, talk, embrace, envelop our understanding the best that we can, at least our beginning understanding of, of how to be better citizens and allies to indigenous people. And I think that through um, small events like this, um, it's going to be easier to introduce um, indigenous leaders, elders, educators. It will be easier to, to have someone join us and, and to help assist us in this learning process. And I think the fact that we're here first on our own doing this work is the first step that will bring some indigenous inclusion to us. Um, and by us doing the work and showing that we're doing the work, um, it will help. Um, it, I hope it will help bring us some, some people to join us and to uh, speak with us real time um, so we can share in their perspective and not just have to watch videos. But Stacy, you've done great work and, and this is extremely important. And uh, yeah, I can't, uh, I can't thank everybody enough. And I hope that I'll be able to uh, help extend um, an opportunity to, to try and um, have someone join us and, and, and speak to us and we'll be able to prove to, to that person eventually that we're here um, to listen. And this is how it starts. So thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you so much, Kevin. That, that would be fabulous. We certainly extend an open invitation to uh, an, 
a indigenous person who can give us their knowledge. And uh, Kevin, I so appreciate you being here and giving us your knowledge. I know that you have uh, a, a lifelong history with the indigenous uh, up there in Canada and it's very much appreciated. Uh, Kathleen, Kat, would you like to give us your closing remarks? Uh, well, I, I think we can learn a lot from the Native Americans about how to respect the land. Uh, I think that it's very, we have to do a lot and now, you know, pretty much. I, I saw a documentary with a, a Swedish scientist and David Attenborough, and he said that we were already in the red zone on four out of the nine levels of uh, of like destruction like if we go into the bread zone on all those nine levels it will mean mass extinction so it is, it is critical that we change uh the way we farm the way we do things uh the way we produce uh food we should always leave land aside that we don't farm you know, maybe for the next year or two, you know, we need to sort of con conserve farmland or it's going to get to the point where we don't have any farmland. So I think we need to start being very environmental and try to do something similar to what the Native Americans did in that Canadian forest. That's it. Yes, such a good point. Thank you for your perspectives, Kat. And uh, I wanna jump on there and say, this is so important now. And Dr. Judge said that as well. This is the time to do it. And, and when he said it, although he was really speaking from his heart and saying how important it is now, it, it, it didn't like totally alarm me. I just love his energy in, in bringing this information to us. It was, it was good for my heart. And Cynthia, would you have some closing remarks for us? Why, I, yes, I do believe I have some closing remarks. Um, <clears throat> first of all, my apologies for not contributing more, but I, I gotta tell you that, that that song he did put me into like a full on meditation. <laughs> I think I was comatose for about 10 minutes straight. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but second, uh, so much of this conversation brings me back to, and, and I'm sorry to keep dragging this into it, but back to the original question I asked at, at uh, the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls conversation, uh, you know, because a lot of times the argument is, you know, well, why don't they just assimilate? And, and again, my question is why? You know, like, how does that make sense? Because we ha we do nothing but destroy everything we touch and they seem to have managed to find a way to make a good society. So why wouldn't we use the evidence that they have provided and do that thing that they're doing? Like, it, you know, it just seems so simple. Um, and, and I understand that, you know, within within the tribes and they were against and for each other and, and you know, there were atrocities being committed on whatever level they wanted to commit those atrocities. Uh, but that was within their society. And overall, they certainly do seem to have figured out how to live with other people, which is something uh, the colonizers don't seem to have figured out. So, uh, and, and again, I keep coming back to this. Why, why, why would it ever seem like a good idea to anyone that they assimilate to our culture? And, you know, I, I, think that we should probably be assimilating to theirs. That's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Very grateful. Love and gratitude to each and every one of your beautiful selves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Cynthia. So, so happy to have you here. And uh, I absolutely, absolutely agree. Why on earth would we ask them to be like us? <laughs> We've got to be like them. That's the answer. There's no other way about it. End of end of deal. We've got to be more like them. Cool. Our, oh, go ahead, Cynthia. Uh, yeah, one more thing. Uh, I I have graciously asked Stacy. Uh, Stacy has been gracious enough to to agree to bounce names uh, uh, with me after the meeting. If if anyone else here would like to do that, that would be amazing. Thank you. 
yeah, guys, hang out and, and talk after the meeting if you'd like. Uh, Cole, are you back yet? Would you like to give us any closing remarks before we leave? I don't think Cole is there. Sybil, I know you joined us late, but would you like to make any comments? I don't guess so. I guess we're all done here. So I will say thank you all so much for participating in this Citizen Assembly Indigenized meeting. And please come back next week and give us your insights and experiences about indigenizing your life. Thank you all very much.